Okay, it looks like we're uh, all ready to get uh, started. Uh, hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the uh, SME's A Day in the Life webinar series brought to you by Engineers for Engineers. I am uh, Rani Harun and your host for today's webinar. Uh, first, I hope you're all staying safe wherever you are. Uh, and for those uh, that are attending uh, our event for the first time, what is the purpose of this webinar and what's a day in the life webinar series all about? Uh, you probably wondered at some point um, what a day in the life of a mechanical engineer working at top companies like Tesla, SpaceX, or NASA would be like. Now you have the chance to uh, find out through this interactive webinar. Um, I hope you all can uh, hear me okay. If you can, please uh, uh, send me, uh, please post um, uh, something on the, on, the, on the YouTube chat. So I assume that everybody's hearing me fine. The, uh, let's see here. Okay, so in a minute or so, I'll introduce our special guest uh, speaker uh, of today. Uh, but first, let me tell you how this uh, webinar will work. Uh, starting with uh, some housekeeping, all webinar participants are signed in in a listen mode uh, only. Uh, so please uh, type in any questions you might have in the dialog box on the webinar platform anytime during, the, anytime during this webinar. Uh, all questions uh, will be answered after the introduction of our guest speaker. Uh, you may ask any kind of uh, questions, whether it's related to uh, the mechanical engineer, engineering field, uh, the company, the industry, uh, career related questions, or any uh, questions related to uh, the speaker uh, job or position. Um, so for those who are not uh, familiar with uh, how YouTube works. Um, the way that uh, if you have any questions, and again, please uh, let me know if you cannot hear me clearly, uh, you would use the YouTube, uh, YouTube chat and, uh, and post your question there. And like I, uh, I just uh, mentioned, we'll try to answer as many questions as, uh, as we can. And, uh, and do not uh, hesitate to, uh, ask your questions on the, on the YouTube chat here. So uh, let's get started uh, and introduce you to our guest speaker. Uh, please uh, meet uh, Benjamin uh, Salmon, a staff wells uh, engineer at Shell. We're very excited to, uh, to have you, uh, Ben. It's actually the first time that we, are, that we have a guest speaker from the uh, energy industry. So far we've had uh, guest speakers from the aerospace and um, and uh, mechanical, uh, sorry, in the um, healthcare uh, industry, and it's the first time that we have someone from the uh, energy industry. So we're very excited. So at this stage, uh, Ben, I'll let you uh, uh, introduce your, yourself. Uh, if you can, just uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I will let you uh, take it from here for uh, for for your introduction. Oh, thanks, Ronnie. Can you can you guys hear me and see me? Yeah, should be uh, should be fine. Yeah, oh, okay. all right, sounding good. Yeah, go ahead. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I appreciate the time and the, the opportunity to come talk with you guys and um, give you kind of a rundown of what I do. Normal day to day tasks, if you want to call it normal, of, of what's involved in being a, a wells engineer at Shell and wider in the upstream field uh, in the energy industry. Um, first off, just a little bit of background about on me. Um, I originally graduated college in 2010. Um, my undergraduate major was uh, applied mathematics. I didn't know really what I was going to do right now. I, I knew I liked solving problems. So uh, I, I messed around for a year and then I decided I wanted to go back to uh, school to become an engineer. So I had uh, applied to grad school uh, for mechanical engineering because those are the, the most interesting problems I saw that I wanted to solve. So um, I uh, ended up going uh, to graduate school at the Colorado School of Mines in uh, Golden, Colorado, which was beautiful, gorgeous for a multitude of reasons uh, with, associated with school and outside of school. Um, then I went to, uh, I 
I did got my master's there. Uh, while I was getting my master's, I did uh, two internships. One at a, a small independent company uh, in Southern Colorado. I was in the field helping um, production engineers um, with their pump jacks, their nodding donkeys, uh, as well as troubleshooting any other issues that they had down uh, in that particular um, operating unit. And then um, I did another internship at Shell uh, as, a, as a drilling engineer in uh, Northwestern Colorado. It was, uh, it was gorgeous um, field and, uh, and a place to work. Um, and then after, after that, I, um, once I graduated, I took a full-time position working for Shell in New Orleans, which I reside now in um, as a completions engineer. And I'm, I can go through and, and give a, a quick breakdown of the difference between drilling and completions, but they both do fall under the, the wells um, field uh, in upstream. Um, but for the almost the past seven years, I've been working on completions and well interventions on uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico, oil and gas wells and injectors, uh, as well as um, I did a quick quick stint in the Middle East. I worked in Oman as a, as a, as a field supervisor and kind of an engineer troubleshooting in the middle of the desert, um, which was just interesting in itself. Um, but uh, the majority of my time has been uh, working on platforms and a little bit of uh, in the real front end and in the equipment selection for uh, a couple of the spars and the uh, drill ships. So uh, that's, that's my background. I, I guess at this point, uh, what I, what I'd like to do is walk through, uh, you know, what a, what a relative. Yeah. So we can, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, so for those uh, uh, who are listening in, uh, please do not be shy and ask any questions that uh, you may have at this point. So I will kick it off uh, with our usual uh, question uh, for you, Ben, is uh, what does uh, uh, your day, typical day look like if, uh, if there is a such, you know, typical day? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, so I, I think COVID colors everything, right? Like that's, uh, right now I'm working at home. You're seeing my, my living room right now in, in New Orleans. Uh, and so uh, in that context, uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of my day involves meeting to discuss um, projects that are upcoming, uh, that are in the middle of execution or projects that have finished and, and we're looking back and seeing what we could have done better. And um, I, I wanna focus really right now on the front end like the, we call it the, the engineering design work that we do uh, when we need to deliver uh, well completion in the Gulf of Mexico. There is, excuse me, a substantial amount of modeling. Uh, we have some proprietary software packages that we utilize for, um, we call it torque and drag analysis to make sure we don't um, uh, break any of our tubulars or our work strings when we are running in about a hole to do specific operations. We also have a, a really nice program that can help us um, model the, uh, the thermal and pressure effects of uh, different well conditions on our specific uh, completion designs uh, throughout the life of the well. And so um, early on in, the, in the, the, the well delivery process or the design phase, we, um, we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time on the engineering side designing for I want to say every uh, possible eventuality, but a lot of contingencies to make sure that uh, our well design is robust, it's safe, it's efficient, and and also cost effective. So we'll I'll be meeting with my fellow engineers through the day to talk about that um, if they have any issues with their specific well designs or they want assistance with it, um, as well as talking to SMEs and then ultimately the the technical assurers in our organization that are responsible for signing off on the work and. Um, before we, we place any you know, major equipment purchases or, or actually start the execution for the, the particular well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, getting the first few questions uh, there, so I'm just gonna start um, in the order. So I have Tristan asking uh, uh, for advice you have for first year engineering students. Okay, so I think, I mean, you're gonna be taking most of your 
your pre your prereqs and your your core courses at that point. So, you know, I'd say the fundamental math, physics, chemistry, uh, materials courses that I took are, are are stuff I still lean on today. So, my advice at this point just to go through and get those fundamentals down right because the, you will keep coming back to them again and again as a as an engineer in your in your professional life. And is there any, um, so far, I guess, for your specific field, so I'm not quite sure if that's what Tristan is asking, but for the, um, for someone who is interested in getting in your field, is there mm -hmm. any specific course, any specific uh, uh, maybe internship uh, that he needs to, uh, that he needs to focus on that will, I guess, increase his chances uh, yeah. to, to get in, into the field? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, Chell, Chell and, uh, and the, the energy industry as a whole, I think they're still offering internships to bring in talent into the organization. So um, we, they I haven't looked at it lately, but they're, they're, they are posted online and, and those are helpful to get your foot in the door to, A, hey, it's, it's two ways. It's, it's to see if you like the industry, to see if it's something that suits you, your personality or your interests, and also to get evaluated for a potential position in the future. So internships are great. I did, I did one. I was actually this past summer, an intern supervisor. So it was kind of weird being on the other side of that and, and evaluating and, and, and helping guide them to, to finish their projects. So um, it, it's very vibrant. It's something that uh, if you look online, you, you should be able to find them. Um, they come on in the fall. So, um, and I think they should probably should still be on right now, but it's getting late in the season. So if you have an opportunity to apply, you should. Okay. Are there specific uh, courses, specific uh, tools, maybe programming languages, uh, maybe, uh, and I'm just throwing out, you know, things that, that are outside uh, of internship that he, uh, while he's still at school, that he can learn while he's, uh, while he's at school. So we, um, you know, you know, one of the core competencies, you know, just the engineering skill set is, is valuable just to have that technical knowledge so that you can go through and you can look designs and you can look at outputs of particular softwares and know if it's, you know, is this valid or if there's something wrong. So there's that, there's, there's project management. And also we are actually pushing for a pretty, pretty hard right now for in the, in the digitalization front. So an additional skill set that we're trying to grow I'm myself, I can talk about specifically is, is the coding background that I, I built during uh, my undergraduate and grad school years that has been kind of been dormant, you know, outside of the generic Excel file or, or the VBA that I have to mess with. Um, so uh, the advantage that a, a first year engineering student have would have right now is that they can build those skill sets. And by the time they get out into the field, into their, their full-time job, um, you know, in, they have the, the, the background in Java or C or C++ or anything like that, that they can utilize uh, because it's becoming a pretty, pretty integral part of the work we're delivering every day. Um, so that's, yeah, I would, I would, if there's an opportunity for you to take those, those uh, programming courses or uh, software development courses, that's, that'll be a definite advantage to you as you move into the workforce. Okay, th thank you, Ben. Uh, another question here from Corey. Uh, as one currently uh, working at a small company, so about 90 employees, uh, how has your experience during your time at the small company versus your time at a, lo at a large company like Shell uh, be? Uh, it, there's a, it, it's funny because there's, I mean, just by the nature of its scale. Like there's, there's less layers at a small independent versus a major international oil company. So, I mean, there's, there's uh, additional approvals and that you need to go through to, to get your designs approved, to, to get anything, you know, if you want to deviate from, from a standard, we have a whole bunch of standards at Shell that we, we hold to that, that are, that are valuable for us when we go through our our design processes and um, those those didn't exist at a small company, um, you know, for better or for worse. Uh, and um, so sometimes that's kind of that can be kind of liberating. But uh, on the flip side, like the standards that we we employ at Shell are there to, to help protect us and help keep us out of trouble. So like the the additional oversight and um, I guess the the requirements 
especially with the level of exposure we have, I think are, are warranted and they're needed. But you know, that, that was, when I look back on my time, that summer I spent, it was, you know, there are some stuff right now. Uh, I look back on it, I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe I did, we did that. Or we were able to move that quickly because um, that, that's not necessarily uh, what I always see in my day-to-day -day work now. Okay. Um, an interesting question from uh, um, Shane here. Uh, wondering what the, uh, the future uh, for mm -hmm. Shell will look like, and uh, especially with non-renewables, um, you know, on their way out. So just yeah. uh, curious, yeah, I think it's actually a very good question. No, it's, it's something that we talk about all the time right now. What are we going to do when in the net zero world, we're, we're trying to, 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 to figure that out at the moment. I think, um, and when I, when I think about it in my own situation, that there is a there's still a significant need for um, people with a, a well engineering drilling completion skill set in um, the, the the net zero world. When you when you think about uh, first of all carbon capture, uh, storing CO two underground, the the, the same the same skill set needed to the, the skill set needed to install those wells, drill those wells, complete those wells is the same that exists for to make producing wells. So. Um, as, as the world, as that technology advances and it becomes wider spread and, and more prevalent, I think they will still need a good, good bit of um, well engineers per se to, to deliver that work. And, um, and, and furthermore, like there's, there's an enormous amount of old wells that need to be properly abandoned so that they don't bubble up to surface or cause any other uh, environmental issues. So that's, that's also an avenue where I see uh, potential work and, and that's where Shell needs to, to maintain their, their reputation and making sure those things um, don't cause any more environmental damage. So, um, but that's, that's how I, I think about it. I, I had somebody tell me not too long ago that um, he had a mentor that told him that, that the problems that you work on at the beginning of your career are not gonna be the same ones that you work on at the end of your career. So um, I kind of keep that in mind of being, uh, when I think about the work I'm doing and, and the work I'm doing at Shell, it's, it's, it's it's going to change. And um, just to be, to be, to have a growth mindset and be flexible about it has been kind of my North star in this whole situation, just so I can, um, can react and respond to, to what, what comes next. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in particular that you are, are kind of uh, doing right now to grow your career and prepare for, 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 for that? Is there anything like that? It's, uh, it's, I, I continue. It's for me personally, it's just like, I continue to network and I continue to learn as much as possible about all the stuff that's going on at Shell with, with new energies and, and, and the, the big arm we're building up with that uh, part of the business uh, to prepare for the net zero world that we're going to go to. So I'm just trying to stay on the cutting edge of it and, and make those connections so that um, if something comes up that's interesting to me and I've, I've, I've got the requisite skill set, I can go and uh, contribute and, and do that particular job if, if, if an opportunity arises. Okay. Question from uh, Don. Uh, very interesting question. So how is workload distributed lately uh, uh, with uh, COVID? Uh, I think what he's thinking is that every engineer uh, can be in the field, but are there like rotations or permanent rig engineers now? So basically how you know, with uh, the work that needs to be done on the wells. I mean, how is the workload distributed among the, uh, the engineers there? So there's, there's typically a one lead engineer in charge and, and they'll, they'll manage all the permits, they'll manage, um, uh, kind of take, take charge on the, the, the well design and the, uh, the equipment purchasing, and then they'll parse out specific parts uh, to, to less, or I guess like more junior engineers to, to manage it and help build their skill sets. And then those particular engineers, um, if it's a critical operation, will go offshore and be the point of contact for uh, the operations people, as well as the, the lead engineer in the office. So it kind of, it gets piecemealed out with, with one person kind of guiding the whole process to make sure nothing gets missed. Okay. Um... So more questions, uh, I guess, related about the field. And I uh, guess I'm uh, 
I'm not surprised because again, I think I mentioned this to you, Ben, it's the first time that we have someone from the energy industry and like, uh, I think we kind of touched on that with the, the oil industry not being something that is going to be forever, it's going to evolve. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some, I uh, guess, concern about getting into that industry, uh, yep. not knowing that there is going to be security forever. So what, are, what is your advice on that, I guess? So, I mean, there's, there's always going to be uncertainty. Um, the way that I think about it is that um, I, I, I stay flexible. I keep a growth mindset. I always try to learn. I'm always making connections. That, that is my, I want to say it's a safeguard, but it's, that's my main strategy for, for tackling that and, and, and being prepared to, to pivot and shift to um, ideally get ahead of, of where, the, where the next thing's going to be so that um, uh, my skills are still, they're relevant and um, I, can, I can deliver value. So being, being prepared for change is the, probably the most important quality you can have in, in this type of environment. And, uh, and the other thing too, and I think you also mentioned that is, uh, I mean, mechanical engineering is uh, with the skill set that you are great. Up, regardless of the industry, mm -hmm. you can apply that in so many other uh, industries, right? Um, so let me ask you this, if uh, uh, you, so going back to when you were ready to decide what industry to get into. Um, what, if you didn't do what you were doing now, so working for Shell, no industry, was there any other uh, industry or any other, um, you know, role that you would have uh, um, considered after you graduated, you know? Oh, I, I mean, I, I did the, I looked at the normal roles that uh, a lot of mechanical engineers look at. I looked at the, the automotive industry. I looked at the aeronautical in, the industry. I, I, you know, the, um, those, those were the big ones for me. I knew I wanted to get work at a place that had <clears throat> interesting problems to solve. And that ideally I, I thought it'd be cool to make stuff. So that's one of the, uh, the, the, the major kind of, if I, if I didn't take the job at Shell or if I hadn't done the internships, that's where, I've, where I think I would have let my career take me is to kind of be um, in the more production manufacturing. Um, I even, even got some robot stuff in there. I think I took a few classes in grad school about that as well. So I think that, that's probably where I would have ended up if, mm -hmm. I had, if I hadn't gone to the energy world, I guess. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ben. Another question from uh, Zunesh. Uh, how is the landscape for multidisciplinary engineering students in the energy industry? Oh, it's great. I mean, the, 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 that having those, those multiple uh, disciplines, skill sets, it, it makes you more palatable to uh, a wider range of opportunities in the energy field. Like I work with a lot of um, a lot, of chem, a lot of chemical engineers, a fair bit of petroleum engineers, but actually the majority of people that I, uh, not the majority, probably 30, 40% are also mechanical engineers. And they keep popping up in places all over Shell and in the upstream, downstream, midstream, all the places because of the, the flexibility and skills. And, and having another degree on top of that can, can only aid in that, um, having, having more options. Okay. And... Uh... Uh, the uh, another question from uh, Shane: What uh, role is AI, ML, if uh, anything, is playing at uh, at Shell? I know you mentioned uh, kind of uh, learning some programming language, so I'm guessing that Shell is probably also does need some uh, some software, you know, uh, computing skills and, uh, and things like that. We are, we are dipping our toe into it right now in preparation <laughs> for, for going full bore, jumping into the pool on this one. Like I said, we got a big digitalization push. We're trying to, we, we have an enormous amount of data that just exists in, uh, from, from years and years of, you could say, production, uh, well delivery, all that. So once, once we digitalize and, and, and make a platform where it's easily accessible, we're going to start uh, 
putting some of the big machines on it and seeing if we can find trends and patterns as a, as a way to um, identify uh, potential, I could say potential cost savings or potential opportunities that we missed in the past that uh, we couldn't see because we didn't have it all laid out together. So um, I think AI, it's still for, for us, from what I've seen, it's still in its infancy, but I, I see it as a huge enabler, enabler going into the future uh, to help us more effectively complete our jobs and um, and safe and to do it safer as well. Okay, but is there like any uh, practical application that you? Uh, uh, I mean, if you can share that, uh, I'm not sure, but is there like any practical application that uh, Shell is doing the uh, AI and ML? I'm trying to think right now. We 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 have a couple. Uh, kind of mini projects but like they haven't i haven't seen results from them yet mm -hmm. but they are i can i know that there is there are ai's being deployed in in a very limited way to see if it can um, it can match up to what what humans are doing as okay. far as uh, delivering okay um another so question from matt any thoughts about oil and gas companies outsourcing engineering work to other countries via technical centers or support centers. A lot of engineering work can be done from a remote location. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think COVID has proven that. Like uh, the majority of our organization right now is, is not in an office, but we are delivering our work um, regardless. So I can say that, and this is just my hunch that the remote work thing is, is here to stay in some form much more than it was in, in the past. Uh, as far as outsourcing, I think we've, we've always, um, <clears throat> or I, from what I've seen, we've, we've had technical centers outside of the United States to help us uh, deliver work. And uh, we've worked pretty closely with them and it, it's been um, a, a important, valuable relationship. So I, I think that that's, that's gonna be around uh, for a while as well too. I, I treat it as it's, it's just a, it's a necessary requirement to, to deliver the business today. Okay. Uh, let's uh, switch gears a little bit and uh, I guess learn more about your, uh, your specific uh, role. Um, and I guess the one question that Corey has, which is a very good question is uh, with so many wells across the country, is relocation to various locations likely throughout your your, your career? Uh, I think this, Ronnie, you said relocation or is that? Yeah, relocation. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so it's, it's funny you bring that up because that was like one of the things that, that really attracted me to the, the, the energy world is that there was opportunities to, to move around. And I, I, like I said, in my introduction, I, I did have an opportunity to work in the Middle East and I, and I enjoyed it very much. I think that um, there, there will be targeted opportunities depending on the size of projects and the, the, the local content or the local content requirements and, and the capabilities for, for people to, to move around and, and, and support them as needed. It, a lot of it comes down to, to what's, what's the business need and then what's the personal situation of the person. So some people are open to it, some people aren't. I, I am. I, I told my wife that too. We're still having a discussion, but it's it's going to be positive at some point. But um, yeah, I think there are plenty of opportunities uh, for the people for people with the right skill set are open to it to support um, projects worldwide in yeah. their locations. The nice thing with uh, Shell, I assume, is that I mean, since it's such a large company, they all it's a global company. They all over the, the world. Um, and uh, I'm sure in the U.S. they're probably everywhere. So I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, in terms of locations, the uh, the options are are limitless. Um, uh, I, I would think. Um, now, in terms of um, your uh, going back to, um, I guess your your day to day, um, you know, tasks and things that you do on a daily basis. So let's start with the, let's start with your challenges. Um, what are they? So, I, I mean, it's, this is, this is, uh, this is one of the things I like, and this is one of the things that can be really annoying sometimes, but uh, every day, every day is different, it, it, especially when uh, you're, you're following a, a rig around and they're, 
you're delivering completions or drilling or interventions or any of that, that, that well scope. Um, so sometimes it's, it's, you're, you're, you're working on a particular project that the thing you're working on is, you know, 10 to 15 to 20,000 feet below you. So you have to, you have to have a, a, a good ability to visualize what's going on down there, or at least think, you know, what's going on there in order to troubleshoot any of the challenges that you might have, or, um, you know, give recommendations uh, on paths forward so that you can, you can get through your issues and, 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 and deliver your, your project on time, on budget, with no injuries. So, you know, just being uh, in an environment where it's, I'm not gonna say anything can happen, but you, you plan for contingencies and contingencies. And then the thing that happens is the one thing you probably didn't plan for. So just being flexible and, and uh, you know, prepared to, to bounce back and answer those calls is, is, is well, probably the, the biggest challenge I have. <laughs> <laughs> in the day to day, but it's it's also rewarding, right? Because this is this is this is why we get into engineering, right? You want to solve problems, and that's that's at the core of what we do. Okay. Otherwise, as far as uh, I think you kind of uh, touched on that earlier, uh, when you talked about um, you know working for a big company it has uh, more layers of bureaucracy and things like that. So, just wondering in terms of uh, I guess getting your um ideas you know your design approved uh is this uh you would say one of the challenges you have as far as uh, working for 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 shell and big companies that like like a lot of bureaucracy if, i mean it, there's there's processes and the the processes are there for a reason so that we can deliver the best end product so like i understand where they come from and i think they do serve a purpose and a lot of times it's 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 the design's fine it's just you, you, you need to use some, utilize some of the soft skills to, to influence people into um, just, you know, feeling confident to, to, to approve it. So that's outside of the engineering work. That is one of the biggest things that I've learned in my role is just uh, to how, how to, to manage um, and, and kind of navigate those waters. It, it, it's been pretty vital. Okay. Um... Now, in terms of, um, uh, so we talked about, you know, cha challenges. Uh, how about uh, things that uh, really get you uh, excited uh, <laughs> in, the, in the morning, like when you, when you, you know, first wake up and uh, getting ready to, uh, to, to, uh, to start with uh, your day? What are the things that you, uh, you really uh, like and are passionate about uh, about this specific about this specific field, not the mechanical engineering field in general. So you mentioned earlier, you know, loving solving problems, but is there anything specific that really gets you excited about that specific industry? So I, I have thoroughly enjoyed the people I've worked with. It's the we there's a broad swath of people from. Uh, you know, all over the world that I've had an opportunity to, to interact with and deliver work with. And they've, they've, they've all been great. They've been motivated. They've been helpful. They've, they've wanted to do their best and deliver a great end product. And that's, that's one of the things that I've, I've learned that I really value about my job and, and the people uh, uh, and the place I get to work because I, I know that's not given. Like that's, it, it can be difficult sometimes to, to work with uh, certain, you know, uh, groups in your company or different company, outside companies. And, and I haven't had that issue or I haven't had it frequently enough to, to note. So I, I'd say like the opportunity, even in the COVID remote world to, to work with people on my team and outside my organization um, on a day-to-day -day basis has been really energizing for me. And it's kept me going in this strange time. Okay. Um, quite another question from Curry that's kind of related to, to that. So I'm going to ask you now, what level of education uh, do most engineers at Shell have? So it, it depends. There's a, there's a wide variety of roles. Uh, most minimum, most have, have, a, have an undergraduate degree in something. Mostly it's engineering, but um, you know, we, do, we do get some people that have you know, applied physics or anything like that. Uh, there are a couple of people like me that have master's degrees. Um, and then if you get into the R and D part of the business, like you're inventing new technologies for not just 
wells or drilling or completions, but in general, most of those people have PhDs and they're authoring papers and they're going to conferences and whatnot, and that's their deliverables. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, if you think back to when you started uh, with, uh, with Shell in terms of uh, your uh, say responsibilities when you started uh, versus now, um, can you walk us through basically how things have changed for you in terms of uh, maybe, uh, I think there, I think Dunt here is asking more about uh, responsibilities, uh, skills mm -hmm. needed, biggest challenges and things. Yeah, I think that's what he mentioned here. So yeah. what has changed? So I think as, as, I've, as I've gained more experience, gained more technical knowledge, gained just become more competent, I've been getting uh, work that has, that, that's, I don't want to say this. It's it's more and more. I don't want to say it's valuable, but it's the dollar price associated with the projects has gone up. So initially, um, you know, it's almost I, I might have a project that's worth you know tens of thousands of dollars that I'm in charge of ex executing. I think that was you know first six or seven months in the job. You know, almost seven years in, you you go up to to being responsible for jobs that are in the millions of dollars. So that that increase in dollar amount has also been an increase in complexity of the problem or the, the project uh, as well as what's involved in actually delivering it. So it's, I would say it's been linear. It's more like a sawtooth of how the, the responsibility increase has been, but it's typically been trending up and, and up in a pretty big way as, as time's gone on in, in terms of dollars and complexity and then just the nature of the project. Hey, Ronnie, you there? Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, cool. I think cool. it was, yeah. Uh, no, what is the offshore energy industry doing in response to the increase in natural uh, disasters? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so I think this is, this is a good question because I, I live in New Orleans and like it's been, this year in particular, it's been crazy. Like we've had a, a ton of storms and, and in particular when, when um, a hurricane or a tropical storm or any major event comes through the Gulf of Mexico, they, they tend to evacuate all non-essential personnel off of the platform, let them go home, reduce the exposure. And then they um, naturally have to, and this isn't just shell, this is all operators, have to shut in their production wells so that um, in the event some, some storm comes through, knocks a platform or uh, something out that you don't have oil and gas spewing into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's, it's a relatively standard approach to, to managing the increase of um, weather events we've had. Okay, th thank you. Um, so the, uh, so we touched on a lot of uh, different uh, questions. Um, so I'm just here looking for any more um, Question from the uh, audience. Uh, let's see here. Um, which are the minor uh, programs should be focused after uh, getting tech and mechanical engineering? Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure what the, what Alfred here is uh, is saying. Uh, okay, so let's try it. Could you be more specific about the kinds of engineering analysis you're doing? Are you using FEA, so I'm not, uh, so free uh, body diagrams, the material properties of stainless steel, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah, so there is, there's, there's a specific, we don't have the, this is, this is crazy. The particular organization I work with, we don't have access to that that intense of a of a program mm -hmm. for, for FEA or anything like that. We've we've we are got probably some that would consider two two layers above that in complexity. We don't need to go down to the actual um, microscopic element that we're utilizing. 
I have seen that and we have used it at Shell when we were designing specific pieces of equipment. Uh, as, um, and that I think is pretty, pretty standard either in the, in the vendor or the service industry. Um, uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, you brought up the stainless steel. We always look at material properties for our tubulars, um, um, what, what the heat conduction looks like, uh, like what, what, what we can use for a temperature duration um, so we can map it over time, what the performance is gonna be as the well changes in performance to make sure that that particular material will stand up to whatever conditions we put under it. Um, there's, there's still a lot of heat transfer, a lot of thermodynamics. Um, we have a lot of discussions on what, what is actually a steady state for a, a temperature profile for a particular well, uh, as well as looking at just you know, some of the fluid, fluid mechanics and, and, and hydrostatics that are involved uh, during well operations. And, and, and seeing, you know, we've got X amount of fluids in the well and we're trying to uh, displace them without damaging a piece of equipment. How do we manage that? Go, go like that. It, 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 it straddles a pretty big range uh, depending on um, what phase we are, you know, design, execute, or you know, mm -hmm. gonna do a look back of what level of software and, and analysis we're using. How about uh, additive manufacturing AM? Is it uh, being used now and now um, at any, yeah, any uh, uh, part of the design uh, in wells, in the wells of uh, oil and industry? We we are we work really closely with our with our vendors, uh, our major you know, service companies when we need uh, a specific piece of equipment or a, a component that is not what we you know, already out in the market and and we will go and reach reach probably too far into their business to uh, to help them design it to ensure that we are it's going to meet our requirements as it and by. You know, by that, just make sure that it's going to meet the well conditions and, and be able to be robust enough to survive in a in a, in whatever environment we predict or we you know, we imagine could happen that it will be placed in. Okay, um, so it's 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 so it's being used. So you said that you mm -hmm. have okay, okay. Uh, any particular application? I think actually someone, yeah, Shane just asked that, uh, that question, uh, shedding some light on additive manufacturing techniques in the energy industry. Okay, yeah. So we're looking at, uh, at that. The, the, the biggest thing I can think of is we have a, a, a small component that's made out of ceramic and we're, we're seeing if we could, you know, honestly, if we can 3D print some of them um, and then try to see if we can take it to the next level with some of those additive uh, manufacturing techniques to, to cut down our lead times as well as um, I think we can make a more robust piece of equipment when we do it that way outside of the standard manufacturing approaches that we're using with casting and whatnot. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you often have to deal with heavy regulations when it comes to your projects or is it most of that taken care of uh, before you start? on the project. So I think you kind of touched on that a little bit uh, mm -hmm. earlier, but. Um, Absolutely. No, yeah. that's to uh, the Gulf of Mexico in particular is one of the most regulated environments in the United States. And, that, and that's good reason. So I, I, I think that's a good thing. And so we, we have regular communications with our, with our uh, regulatory bodies to make sure, you know, we, we put in our permit. Um, what do you guys think? Do you have any feedback? Do you want to see anything change? Do you have any questions? And uh, we keep that, that dialogue open so that you know, they don't think we're hiding anything and that we're, it doesn't appear like we're trying to, to, to pull any fast ones because we aren't, because we're, we're trying to do the right thing. Okay. Uh, since engineering is a field that relies so heavily on communication, what are some uh, techniques for communication in engineering that you have used during your career? So one of these, uh, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, one that's been effective for me, and I don't know if, it, if this question was looking for a particular style, but um, in, in a lot of the meetings and, uh, that we have, I, I found it very useful if there's something um, that I might not agree with or something I think that can be done differently. And um, I'm, I'm 
getting told something to do a specific activity or go go pursue a particular avenue of, of thought or whatnot. I, I rephrase everything that they want me to, to do in my own words and then get them to agree to it. Mm-hmm. That, and that, uh, yeah. Yeah. that's been very useful because you know, half, to, half the time someone will, be, will look at me and shake their head. No, I don't want you to do that. And that, that's been great because like, that's, that's helpful. And then it's, I think it's also helpful for anybody uh, in management to hear, you know, we, we think about things in our own head and it sounds right. But once someone else says it, it can change pretty drastically. So. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. I think that's what uh, uh, Tristan was uh, asking for. Uh, but if not, Tristan, let us, uh, let us know. Moving on to the next question. How has the boom of uh, the fracking industry impacted the volume location of projects for Shell across the US? It's, um, so I'll take it with a grain of salt because the, the fracking boom hasn't necessarily, it, it's not the same fracking that happens in the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to what you see in South Texas, West Texas, in North Dakota. Um, but, but we do, Shell does have a team that works in West Texas and they have been, um, you know, involved in that, uh, that boom, um, to, to utilize that equipment and that, that technique to, to get oil and gas out of the ground pretty extensively. Okay. Thank you. Interesting question. Uh, here, about <laughs> do you get to fly on helicopters? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, that was the, the main if you're lucky, right? If, if, if you don't get to the heliport too late, you get a, you get a fly the helicopter out to the platform or the drill ship or the survey vessel to uh, go do your work. There was a period of time where I did, I worked a rotation. So I did that every two weeks, went out, worked on a, on a rig and flew back in, had nothing to do. It was, it was awesome. And it was also kind of boring on your days off, but I enjoyed it. But the, the, you have to go through a special helicopter training or they simulate, you know, you crashing, you have to swim out of it and, and how you manage that. So it's, it's interesting. Like it, something I never thought I'd be doing, but it's, it's cool. But you wouldn't go to well just for, for the day, right? Or would you, uh, is, it, or it, is it typically for several days? And how so does that it, 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 you can do a couple of things, but short answer, no, you, you wouldn't go for a day you, unless you are a high, profile individual you could you could do that there those helicopter rides are expensive but uh typically you go for um as an engineer my minimum was usually a week when i was working as a supervisor it was two weeks so you you know you're out there you're living you're eating you're working out you're trying to keep some semblance of uh normalcy while you're in the middle of the ocean okay and how is life there if you can share some uh some uh, Um, it's uh, it's different. I get. I think the biggest challenge is that you you tend to end up living your life in chunks. So it's it gets split into okay when you're offshore and then when you're onshore, and and the challenge is that you know when when you're offshore you I don't I didn't check my phone very much because I knew that like I probably was missing something and that was that was hard. Um, but then when you're onshore you got all this free time and then you realize that like nobody else has that time <laughs> no one has two weeks off where they're not doing anything so you could you travel you can go i, I visited my parents and, and family members a bunch of times but you know you, you find projects you, that's where you get hobbies that's what i would say okay and how often uh, would you say now you uh, you go uh, you do that so the last time i was offshore was in march of this year and it I got caught out there right before uh, the country got shut down with COVID. So um, they've been, uh, ever since then, I had a project that finished, it executed and it was done. And I came back in and I've, uh, they've only been sending engineers out there as needed and they they don't need me at the moment to deliver anything. Okay, so we have another, uh, I think about 10 minutes before we wrap things up. So just uh, going through a few more questions here. So for the, for the audience, please uh, continue asking your questions. I hope that I uh, asked uh, all of them, or at least we touched on the, uh, all of them. 
the one thing that I wanted to ask you is uh, uh, in terms, I think you, you, you kind of uh, also touched on that a little bit uh, earlier. Um, but as far as uh, learning, obviously we'll learn from the, our uh, mistakes. And I think yeah. you said that you are. Uh, uh, so is there, uh, is there any particular, um, and I'm sure you've made a mistake also um, as an engineer. And uh, I guess just while well, wondering if you can share something with us and how, um, what mistake you made and, uh, and um, as an engineer, and how did you fix it? Yeah, I mean, there was, um... Probably more than I want to talk about at the moment. But <laughs> there, I mean, there's there's always there's always an element of uncertainty uh, when you're dealing with, you know, we do all this planning in the in the front end to you know make sure we get our pressures right, and make sure that we, um, you know, get our get our design rights for particular work strings to make sure that we're not going to have any issues. Uh, you know, uh, delivering the project and, and, and meeting in the wider thing, being able to meet our uh, goals as a company, right? Deliver X amount of oil production or gas production or water injection or whatnot. So I, I've had a couple instances where I've got bitten where uh, information that I was given was, uh, you know, I, you make your assumptions based on that and then you make a plan based on that. And um, what the, what the subsurface uh, realization of what the reality was, was different. So typically, you know, we, we, were, we were planning on um, running a particular assembly and, and completion string, and then we had to change it up because we might have had some uh, particular casing deformation or something like that where, well, now we got to move our, this particular piece of equipment up or we got to move it down. We have to move some stuff around and, and we got to do that relatively quickly because, hey, the rig's waiting on us. We can't, we can't be doing nothing right now so uh that's you know usually we we we've got enough flexibility in our designs to manage that but you know it's in the moment it is all hands on deck you're trying to figure out what what your options are how we how quickly we can get out of it it, it usually involves uh, you know changing changing some fluid properties or changing out uh, one type of equipment for another and and i've been lucky enough to, to not be able to do that and not um not cost the company too much money, but still looking back on it, it when, I, when we do our after action reviews, those are the things that always come up that, that we need to remedy so that they don't happen again to another engineer or you know, heaven forbid myself. That, uh, that makes it. Thank you for, for, for sharing that, uh, Ben. Uh, so a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, are opportunities for advancement uh, openly discussed at Shell? Higher position often hired from uh, within or externally? So essentially, we can talk uh, a little bit about um, this carry path at, uh, at, at Shell. So it's, it's, it's the first, I'd say, four or five years, it's pretty structured. There is a, a training program that all of the wells engineers go through and they must meet certain competency requirements. There's, there's written tests, there's job experience they need to have um, that they, they must reach. So like your first five years is pretty set in stone. Like you're going to do X, Y, and Z. And yeah, you know, that, that's it. Um, it. I've seen the company be more flexible once you've reached that level of competency that they sign off that you can be an independent engineer and then uh, opportunities for, for advancement and, and changing roles become much more prevalent. So I'm, I'm going to make seven years in February. So that is like, I'm kind of at the, the beginning of that. And there, you know, there are opportunities within the Gulf of Mexico and, and in, in multiple roles that I could see myself going into um, engineering and non-engineering. I think I want to stay on the engineering side um, that, that could be there for advancement or just broadening or just, you know, continuing to build up my skill set. Nice. Uh, what has the biggest, uh, been the biggest learning curve for you between your initial assumptions of the job versus now? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, 
and this, I think this also just comes with maturity is um, understanding that the, the, in particular the Gulf of Mexico, it's a 24 hour operation. So like something is always going on no matter where you are in the Gulf of Mexico. So understanding that you're not going to have a necessarily a conventional uh, nine to five job. Like that, that's in particular on the well side, when you're, when you're, when you have a rig or a project going on, that's, that doesn't exist. It's, it's all in. So and you're on a call um, for 24, 24 hours of the day. Yep. I've, you know, got multiple phone calls at two, three, four in the morning. I don't, I don't know what I said, but it seemed to have worked because they, they either, they figured out the problem or I gave them enough information for who to talk to and, and go from there. Okay. So, yeah, that was, that was a big thing that my first year, I, I, I don't say I struggled with it, but it took some, uh, time to get comfortable with at the very least. Yeah. So it sounds like it's very, uh, it can be intense uh, when you're offshore, mm -hmm. but once uh, you're not on the, on the wells, you have a lot more uh, free time and um, it's more predictable. I think there were also, I saw questions about um, the work-life balance there. We didn't really, we mm -hmm. kind of talked on that, but uh, I think uh, some people were also uh, asking about that. Uh, but it seems like once you're on shore, I mean, the work-life balance is a lot more um, managed. It's one, it's one of the things that I have enjoyed a lot is that there is a, I would say, a, a rhythm, right? Like when you're on, you're on. When you're off, it's it's much more laid back. And once once you've proven yourself to be, be capable of delivering, um, most managers will let you, you know, run your own schedule as long as you're delivering what you need to deliver. So... And that's become even more apparent during this this work from home COVID. Like people are doing their own schedules, and, and we're, we're making it work. So, thank you. So I think we uh, we're gonna wrap it up. I'm just gonna ask you uh, if there's anything that uh, maybe one last thought, uh, any other uh, thing that you want to share with the with the audience here that we haven't uh, talked about anything. No, I, I just the. The last thing I'd leave this group with is I think mechanical engineers have, have, have a bright future in the, in the upstream and in the energy industry. I think the, the, the skill set that, you, that gets obtained in, in undergraduate or graduate education is very applicable um, to, to the problems that, that we have and that we're, we're tackling right now. And I'm just, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to tell someone to come in to the industry with an open mind and, and try to learn and contribute. And, you'll do well. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ben. Uh, so I'm going to uh, wrap things up here. Uh, you can turn off your video now. So let me do that. Um, I'm going to show, okay. So, so thank you, uh, uh, Ben. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, participating in today's uh, webinar. Uh, and I really hope that you found it uh, um, insightful. Uh, as usual, this webinar will be uh, recorded and will be available online at uh, www.asme.org. Uh, this will be in a few days. and. Uh, Lastly, uh, in a few minutes or so, uh, you, should, you should get uh, a short survey. So if you can please uh, just give us your feedback so we can bring you uh, more speakers like uh, Ben and uh, different uh, maybe topics or other industries that we haven't uh, had the privilege to, to host yet. Uh, so thank you again, uh, and I hope to see you soon. Our next uh, webinar which will be uh, next year in January. So thank you again. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you for the audience, and uh, we'll see you soon on our next uh, webinar. Bye-bye, everyone.